three instruments on stage, but almost 500 instruments out here. And I'm telling you, the human voice is still the best instrument ever, isn't it? What a blessing to hear you singing, declaring how great is our God this morning. He is great, amen? And it's so good to be here just to declare uh, His greatness. Uh, For those of you that are online, I think we even heard you singing today. Uh, Thank you for allowing your voices to be part of us as well. We love our online community. Thank you for joining us and being a part of this. And if this is your very first time at Grand Point, we want to give you a special welcome uh, into the house here this morning. Uh, Let me just uh, give you a few announcements before we jump into our message and before I introduce this brand new message series today called Find Your People. So this is the first day of May, and that means that summer is coming, and that means a lot of different things. But one of the things that it means around the church here is that camp season is coming, right? So we're getting ready. Camps now are preparing their properties. They're getting things cleaned up, and we're getting staffing together at all of our camps. And camp uh, staff are recruiting, you know, students to come in. And uh, here at Grand Point, we have students that go to Rhodes Grove Camp, uh, Joy L Ministries, and Camp Uligua, and perhaps some other camps as well. This weekend, right here at Grand Point, we are highlighting Camp Uligua, and uh, out in the lobby, we have a table set up uh, for you to register your students, grandkids, children, whatever, uh, for for students. And uh, we have one of our camp representatives, Michael Baker, here today. He's out there. Is he in the room here? Michael in the room here? He's outside there. So make sure that you stop out there, get your questions answered about camp. Now, some of you are new to us here at at, uh, Grand Point Church, and you hear this Camp Uligua, and you're wondering, what is that all about? Uh, Uligua simply stands for Youth Living Jesus Way right? Youth living Jesus' way, that's what we want for our kids. And uh, I want to show you a video here that gives a little bit of a glimpse of what happens uh, when you go to camp. So uh, here it is. Check this out. And then I have one more announcement to make for all of you in just a moment. But check this out.
Well, there we go. Now, it's hard to capture everything that happens at camp on one little video, so we'll just stop it right there. But I know that you, everyone out here is wishing you could be doing some of that, aren't you? Handling snakes, blowing fire, obstacle courses. You want to do that, right? So here's, here's the thing. We have an opportunity for you to do this May 21st. May 21st is Grand Point Day at the camp. We have the entire camp for the entire day from 9 to 4, and it is open for everyone. All right, come on out. What The obstacle course will be open. The snakes will be there for you to handle, right? There's some activities at the water parks. All that is for you. Now, just in case you are one of those people who say, I don't want to do any of that stuff, man. I'm not into that. Let me tell you, the, the, the deck is full of rocking chairs. And you can come and spend all day in the rocking chair just watching, observing, <clears throat> taking in the nature of the camp. If you have never been to Camp Ulidua, I want to give you a personal invitation to come on May 21st and spend the day there or just a couple hours if you can. And we're also going to have at 12 o'clock noon, there's going to be a chicken barbecue that the camp is providing for us, and uh, you won't want to miss that. It'll just be a great day for Grand Point to flood that camp, and there's something there for every single one of you. If you want to know more about this or register for it, you go online and uh, check that out and make sure you register. There is a slight cost for that because of the meal and uh, just the camp activity, but we've got the entire day. So if you've never been there or if it's been a long time since you've been there, this is your opportunity to come to the camp. Let's just enjoy a family, a Grand Point family day at, at the camp. One more thing about the camp, and then we're going to jump into the message. This past week, we had our Eastern Region Annual Conference, and it was held at the camp. Grand Point is part of a denomination of churches, so once a year, we have all of our Eastern Region churches come together. It's about 140 churches uh, in the Eastern region. We come together and uh, with representatives, and we just have our conference there. And uh, this past week, on Tuesday, Monday evening, uh, Pastor Dan Culbertson, our guy that runs the production up here, speaks occasionally, he was given his annual ministry license. So Pastor Dan is now an official pastor uh, within Grand Point Church. So give him a hand. I think there were about 12 people that received their ministry license and then also others who were recognized for faithful service. And one of our members that comes here at 815, uh, Alan Mathna, was uh, presented with the recognition of 52 years in ministry. And uh, we just uh, are so grateful again for Alan. I think there he is. And his wife, Sharon, were at the conference as well. Alan was here at the first service, but go ahead and applaud him. Uh, Yes, we just appreciate those men and women who have given such faithful service uh, to the church. Well, all that's, that's enough about camp. If you want to register your children, stop out in the lobby. Uh, go to the camp table right after this service. It is my pleasure to introduce a brand new message series to you this morning called Find Your People. And this flows right out of that previous series from the book of Mark, which ends with the words of Jesus saying, go. So, I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing called the Great Commission. Some of you may have, but maybe others of you are new to the church, new to the Bible. You've never heard about this. Let me tell you what that is. At the end of the Gospel of Mark and at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Mark 16 and Matthew 28, Jesus says, all right, you've seen what I do. You've heard what I, I, I say. You, you are the products of my discipleship. Now, I want you to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. It's kind of the operative word uh, for, for the Christian life. When you think about it, when you read the Bible, you hear a lot of this go kind of language. Go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis. God said to the guy, a guy by the name of Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go to the land that I will show you. Abraham went, not knowing where he was going, and God used him to bless generations and generations. One day, Jacob, the patriarch Jacob said to his youngest son, Joseph, Joseph, I want you to go to Shechem. All your brothers are out there tending the sheep. I want you to go to your brothers, get a report of them, and bring it back to me. Tell them how they're doing. Joseph went. His brothers mistreated him, if you know the story, and they kind of set him on this, this seemingly senseless journey of hardship after hardship, but he became an influential ruler in the land of Egypt, saving many lives. 
God said to Moses one day, Moses, my people in Israel have been greatly afflicted. I want you to go lead them out of Egypt, lead them out of their bondage. And Moses said to God, God, send somebody else. Send somebody else. God came back and said, Moses, nope, I want you to go. You're the man. Moses went and, and, and delivered thousands of people from bondage. Now, these men and many others throughout history saw pieces of God's purpose for their lives, but none of them had the full blueprint before they went. In fact, Abraham went not knowing where he was going. Jacob went not knowing that he would never return home again. Moses went convinced that he could not speak well and unconvinced that anyone would listen. All they knew was God said, go. That one little word is used 1,542 times in the Bible, and it seems to be the operative word for those who follow Christ. For those who are his disciples, God says go. So it's no surprise when Jesus says to his followers, listen, in the New Testament now, when Jesus says to his followers, you've heard me teach. You saw what I do. You are the product of my disciples. Now, I want you to go and make disciples. It's kind of like having kids. After a while, you want them to go. <laughs> go get a job, right? Go get a job. Hey, maybe go get your own place. Go do your own laundry, right? God's no different. He wants his children to go. He doesn't want us just sitting around at home listening to another sermon, which is most likely a rerun anyway. I mean, nothing wrong with that, but that's, he wants us to do more than that. He wants us to go. So in this series of messages all the way through May, I want to take the edge off the Great Commission because there are some of us right now who are just like Moses. God, would you send somebody else? Would you send somebody else to do this? Like, I don't know enough, or I'm not old enough, or what if somebody asks me a question that I don't know how to answer? Listen, I would rather you send somebody else. I'm not sure this Great Commission thing is for me. So through this series, what I'm going to do is just tell you some stories, and in each one of these stories, you will understand even better how you can be a part of the Great Commission. So today I want to tell you about Philip. Philip's story is found in Acts chapter uh, 8, verse 26. In fact, all the stories that we're going to tell you are from the, are from the book of Acts. So Philip's story comes in Acts 8, verse 26, where it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. The first thing I want you to know to take the edge off the Great Commission is that God will lead you. God will direct your going and he will arrange your meetings. Sometimes we have this idea, oh my goodness, if I have to go and tell somebody about Jesus, I have to figure out who this is, I have to kind of come up with this message, I have to know the words, I have to know all of the answers to their questions, well that's, that's a little bit too much, so I'm probably just not going to go. But here's the thing, God will work for you. God has promised that he will work for you. He will send people, and he will send you to the people that he wants you to meet. When we were living in Dallas, Texas, our family car was a station wagon. Anybody remember station wagons? So, so a station wagon, for those of you who don't know, is a car that has this extended roof line that covers a cargo area or a third seat at the back of your car. Now, you might think today of like the Subaru Outback or the, uh, the Audi A4, A6 series, or the Mercedes L. So all of those are like the station wagons, except our car was not a Mercedes. It was a four-cylinder Oldsmobile Cutlass with a third-row seat that faced backwards. Remember those? Anybody have one of those? It was a creative use of space, but not a good design at all, right? Because the person that sat in that seat went everywhere backwards, they're looking at the signs and thinking, wonder what that said, because all they see is the back of the signs. Furthermore, right, when you are, when someone's following a car like that, all you're doing is staring at these people, most likely kids, and so do we wave? What, what do we do with that? Because when you're following someone, you're looking at the car ahead of you. Well, if they have that back seat facing backwards, it's just this awkward exchange. So we had three children. Penn and I sat in the front. The, the, the girls sat in the middle. And then our poor son, Dustin, got that third row seat. He's now 31 years old, and he's still recovering from spending half of his life going backwards. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's not a good design. But that was the car that we had. And uh, one, one year, our family lived in Pennsylvania. We decided we'd like to go to Pennsylvania for Christmas. 
So we'll go a few days before Christmas. We'll try to get home by Christmas Eve. So we loaded this car. We put this big rooftop carrier on that thing, strapped it down, filled it, filled the car. All three kids are in there, positioned with pillows and all kinds of stuff. And we went to Pennsylvania. We were there for a few days, decided we want to get home before Christmas Eve. So we left for home on December 23rd. And we were driving straight through, which is what we did back then, 24 hours straight through. And uh, we kind of took turns driving. And so we're now uh, driving home. It's 2 o'clock a.m. on Christmas Eve. All three kids are sleeping in the back. I'm sleeping in the passenger seat. I always like to point this out because Penny is driving. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we have car problems. And Penny wakes me up and says, Lawrence, there's something wrong with the car. I woke up, and indeed there was. She had the throttle flat to the floor, and we're going about 25 miles per hour. I'm not a mechanic, but it seems like we went from four cylinders to one. Is that possible? I don't know, but maybe half a cylinder. We were just running on something. So we didn't know what to do. I got the manual out of the glove box, and I'm paging through this, like expecting to find what happens when your throttles to the floor and you're going 20, there's nothing in there like that. So we closed that thing and we knew that we had had a major problem. We looked around, there was not a single dwelling in sight, not a single dwelling in sight, not a single light anywhere. We were in the middle of the desert in this bluegrass state and we have car trouble. So we had no idea what to do. We had triple A, but we didn't have cell phones. So we couldn't call anybody. We needed a place where we could call. So, Penny, we're going to have to pull over, uh, you know, just to get this car off the road. Again, nobody was coming, but we just wanted to get off the road. And so we're like, I don't, I don't know what to do. She's like, what, what should I do? What should I do? And I said, well, try to make it up this hill. We're on the crest of this hill, and maybe we can pull over at the top of the hill. Again, we crested that hill, complete darkness everywhere. Not a single light could be found. But as soon as we crested the hill, there was an off-ramp. I said, Penny, take this ramp. We don't know where it goes, just into more darkness. But we went down this ramp, halfway down the ramp. All of a sudden, there was this bright lit sign that said, smile, God loves you. Right in the middle of all the darkness in this desert, was there, there was a sign. And then next to this sign, as we progressed a little bit further, we saw this 24-7 gas station uh, that was open. And Penny wonderfully navigated that limping car down the ramp into the parking lot and right to the front door of this gas station. Guess who was there? We went in. We went in. And, you know, they had a phone, so that was our access to AAA. But we went in. And there was Johnny. Johnny was a local. And for some reason, at 2 o'clock a.m. on Christmas Eve, he was sitting there having coffee. Johnny heard our story. He saw what was going on. He says, hey, wait, before you call, let me call a friend of mine. He called a friend who was a mechanic. That man came out. He he lifted the hood of our car. He told me to start it, told me to stop it right away, put the hood down. And he said, stick a fork in that one, buddy. I think I knew what that meant. Our car was done. Our car was done. The engine was gone. Now, Johnny, the local, came to the rescue. We believe to this day that he was an angel sent by God. Because who else would be in Paducah, Kentucky, at 2 o'clock a.m. on Christmas Eve drinking coffee all by himself? Johnny said, I got a pickup truck out here, and I have a farm just down the road. He said, let me load some things, you know, in my pickup truck. I'll take your wife and your kids to a hotel. Uh, I'll take you, I'll, we'll, we'll take your car to my farm. You can leave it sit there. And then I'll take you to Paducah Airport so you can get a rental car and your family can get home for Christmas. That's exactly what we did. So on the way, you know, on the way to the airport, I got to talk to Johnny about why we were in Pennsylvania and why we were in Dallas, Texas. Told him about seminary and what that means. Told him not once, not twice, but at least three times that he was an angel sent by God to help us out. Thanked him over and over again. Now, I'm wishing, you know, part of the story would be great if he would have pulled his Silverado chariot over to the side of the road and got baptized and all of that, but that didn't happen. But what did happen was this opportunity just to share, you know, our story with him and to thank him for being the one that God used to help us. Now, we still to this day call Johnny our angel as we reflect on that story. And there's a lot more to it. We, you know, how we got the car back and all that. 
But all this is to say, let me go back to the book of Acts, to our story, and let me tell you about Philip, because it says, an angel said to Philip, rise and go to the south. This is a desert place. This is like Paducah, Kentucky, right? Nothing out there. And he arose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He met this very powerful and important man. This guy was the treasure of the whole country, the country which is now modern-day Sudan. And he would be like what we would call the minister of finance or perhaps the secretary of the treasure. And the text says in verse 27, he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and now he was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. I don't want you to miss this next line. The next line says, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. I do not want you to miss this because right here is the modus operandum of the Christian life. Jesus sets it up like this in John chapter 14 when he tells his disciples that he is leaving them and that he is going to his father's house. And he says to them, but not to worry, not to worry. John chapter 14, verse 16, I'm leaving, but I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit, capital Spirit, S, Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither knows him or sees him. But you will know him, for he dwells with you and will be where? In you. He will be in you. Now, everything that Jesus said he will do, he did. He left. And he gave us the spirit to live within us. That's why we call the Christian life the spiritual life. The spirit is in you is one of those dynamics that's hard to understand and it's hard to explain, but it is something that you want to activate. The spirit within you. Because when the spirit within you is activated, it will guide you to find the people that God has prepared for you to meet. See, this all happens by the Spirit of God working in you. Now, I admit this whole idea of hearing from God can seem a bit strange. And we ask questions, legitimate questions like, how can I know the difference between a genuine movement of the Spirit of God in my heart and that, let's say like indigestion, right? Or, you know, something else that's going on in there. Or we ask questions like, how do I know the difference between a special burden that God lays in my heart and maybe some excess emotion that just comes from me not getting enough sleep? Or, or even more so, is the spirit of God thing, the idea of the spirit living within me, is this something that is just made up because it sounds awesome? It sounds like something that we would want to have? Or is it just fictitious? So something I heard in the news this week from New York Times, and you may have heard this as well, but you know, you've heard of heterosexuals and homosexuals. Have you heard yet of fictosexuals? There's something now called fictosexual, which is simply this. These are people who consider themselves married to a fictional character or person. Like they're married to a doll, or they're married to a, a particular person in a video game. I, I'm, I kid you not. This is the newest thing out there now, fictosexuals. And so is that what the Spirit of God in us is like? We're just kind of imagining this or making something up that's fictitious? Well, Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 by asking a question. And he says this in, in chapter 2, verse 11, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? Right? So you know what you're thinking. I don't know what you're thinking. Uh, you don't know what I'm thinking. But we each, we all know what we're thinking because of that spirit that's within us. Right? That makes sense. But then he says, so also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now, this is the part that I love. This is the exciting part of being a Christian. It says, now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. See, when you accept Jesus Christ as your savior, the spirit of God comes to live within you. So now you actually have the mind of God. 
You think the things of God. It's not just your thoughts anymore, but it's God speaking through you. And he continues in, in 1 Corinthians and says, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. See, to the unbelieving world out there, this spirit thing is a bunch of foolishness. Sin? Who cares? Grace? Who needs it? Moral law? I'll just make up my own laws, thank you. Right? Uh, Heaven and hell? Who believes in that stuff anymore? Nobody believes in that. Right or wrong? Who knows? True or false? Who has the right to decide? All that matters is that we're happy and that you hurt no one else. Have you heard that? That's a common theme within the world today. Just, I just want to be happy. If, if we're just happy and you don't hurt anyone else, everything is permissible. And, and so that's kind of what's out there. Now, do you know what else flows out of that line of thinking? Do you know what else flows out of that philosophy of life? There's another question, which is, who am I to tell someone else how to live their life? And, and so we don't. We don't because we kind of buy into this this worldly philosophy like, hey, everybody's got their own things to believe, right? Everybody has their own truth. Like I have mine and they have theirs. They have their religion. I have mine. Who am I to tell someone else how to live? And so we don't. Now, Paul says the spiritual person, though, judges all things, but he himself is to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him but we have the mind of Christ. So this whole great commission thing, this whole thing of living our lives as a witness for the Lord is not trying to convert someone to us. It's not converting them to our way of life or our way of thinking. No, it's introducing them to God himself, the one who is over it all. And so because we have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ living within us, we have the mind of Christ, which simply means that God is going to instruct us through that Spirit that lives within us. See, without the Spirit of God, we're left to this this little pitiful world of ourselves, what we desire, what we want, what we think. Paul David Tripp calls it functional insanity. See, if it's all about us, if it's just our little world that we're living in, if it's all about me and what I want to do, and if it's it's not the Spirit of God living within me, we're living functional insanity compared to living life with the mind of Christ. There's a much bigger world out there than this little world of ourselves, and in that bigger world, there is someone who needs you. There is someone out there who needs you. They need your friendship. They need your encouragement. They need your life experience. They need you to help them understand what they're reading. They need you to love them enough to tell them about Christ. Honestly, these people are out there waiting for you. And you'll know who they are because the Spirit of God will lead you to them. Now, here's what you do. Let me give you some practical response to all this. Number one... If you're not yet a Christian, you don't have the Spirit of God within you to guide you and direct you to those people. You don't have the Spirit of God within you to help you with anything. So number one, if you are not a Christian, if you've never opened your heart to receive Jesus Christ and have the Spirit come to live within you, by the way, you will know if he does because it radically changes your life. And if your life has not been radically changed, perhaps the Spirit of God has not yet entered it. The first thing that you do is you pray and you say, God, I want that spirit of God to come within me. I want that spirit of God to dwell with me. I want to have the mind of Christ. That is your first step. For those of you who have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you now have that spirit within you. So what you do is you pray that nothing, absolutely nothing will hinder the work of that spirit within you. See, any sin 
Any sin that you allow into your life will sabotage the work of the Holy Spirit. It will derail the train of God's plan for your life. Sin will mess you up, and you will miss out on God's best laid plans for your life. In fact, sin will silence God's voice calling you to join someone's chariot. It's exactly why David prayed in Psalm 51, verse 9. He said, God, hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew that right spirit within me. Because see, when the Spirit of God is unhindered, it will be that compelling voice that calls you to action. You want that, don't you? I want that. I don't want to to make the calls in my life. No, I want the Spirit of God, the mind of Christ to do that. So Jesus describes his true, his true sheep as uh, uh, his disciples, his true disciples as sheep, and he refers to himself as the shepherd. And he says in John chapter 10, verse 3, he calls his sheep by name, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They know his voice. See, as a true believer in Christ, one who has surrendered their life to Christ and the Spirit within us, we will understand and hear the voice of God speaking to us. If you're going to live outside of your own little world, you're going to hear and respond to the voice of the Spirit. So number one, you pray that all sin would be removed in your life so that it does not hinder the Spirit of God from working within you. And then, then you pray and you say, God, lead me to the people that he wants me to influence today. Because they're out there waiting for you. Penny and I do this almost every morning. In our prayer time, we admit, we say, God, we've got our agendas, we've got our list, we've got our people, we've got our dates, we've got our... But but if there's anything that is in your plan that's not in our agenda, make us willing to follow you. Lead us to the people, lead us to the things, take us to the places that we did not even intend to go. And prompt us by your spirit to do that. A couple of weeks ago, I was praying about a ministry situation. And uh, a need that was in that ministry, not related to anything here, somewhere else in some other leadership that I have. And God laid on my heart an individual. He brought a name to my mind. Now, whenever God does that, you know, you have to kind of test that. Because if it just comes and goes, maybe it was your own thoughts. But if it comes and stays... If that name keeps coming back, most likely it's the Spirit of God prompting you. And so the name did keep coming back. And this week, I saw that person. And again, the Spirit prompted me to sit down with them and just tell them what God was doing. He was just laying you on my heart, and I don't know what this means. I don't know what it is, but God just affirmed you, you know, for, for this thing that I've been praying about. And, and uh, the person just looked at me and just kind of gave me this odd look. And that's what people will do, right? When God prompts you to come to them, they'll be like, what's that all about? But it was later that day, that individual called me and he said, you know, the conversation we had this morning, he said, you have no idea the burden that was lifted on my life just because of that conversation. He goes, I don't know if God will do anything at all with what he, you know, the ministry situation, but ministry already happened. God lifted the Spirit. That's exactly what will happen to that person that you contact. When the Spirit of God lays someone in your heart and your mind, most likely you are intended to reach out to that person. Call them, write to them, sit down with them, and just let them know what God has prompted you to do. God will do the rest. God will do the rest. So he's going to lead you, right? He's going to lead you into this. This is not something that you have to figure out on your own. Your job is to keep the Spirit of God unhindered. Your job is to pray specifically that God would lead you uh, to that person. I want to encourage you today to develop the habit of listening prayer. See, sometimes prayer for us is just this catalog of needs that we present to God. God, help me do this. Help me do this. Give me a good day. Give me the great weather and all those kind of things. This catalog of needs that we present to God. One of the benefits of a listening prayer is that you just get quiet before God and listen. And when he puts someone's name into your mind and your heart, most likely that is his call and his direction for you to join them right? Jump in their chariot because they have a need that God has prepared for you to meet. 
This is amazing. And we think about 450 people in this room, we're all going to go out of there, and if God prompts every single one of us toward one person, a lot of lives will be changed this week. Now, here's the thing. Verse 30 says this, the Spirit said to Philip, go over, join his chariot. Now watch this, verse 30, Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? The guy says, how can I unless someone guides me? Look at the doors that are starting to open. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, I don't want to read something into this that is not there, but I think this chariot was a moving target, right? It's not until verse 38 that the eunuch commanded the chariot to stop. The spirit prompted Philip to find his people, and his people, his person is in a moving chariot. She had to run after him to catch him. See, the person that God wants you to meet might not stop for you. It might not be obvious that they want to talk to you. In fact, they may give every indication that they don't even want to talk to you or meet with you. They're rolling on with their lives. They're a moving target. They don't look like they need anything. They've got their chariots. They've got their positions. They've got their activities. They've got their stuff, and they're not stopping for you. That person is most likely not going to come to you and ask you for help. They're not going to come to you and say, hey, I need a little of encouragement today. They're not going to come to you and say, hey, I'm reading the word of God and I don't understand this. No, the spirit of God is going to prompt you to go to them. And you may have to run after them, but if God prompts you to meet with them, run after them because they have a a need that God has prepared for you to meet. See, behind the clothes and behind the cars and behind this whole I've got it together persona, there's a deep longing for life that is not being met by all of their materialistic acquisitions. No, there's something that God has prepared for you to meet. And the sad part of all this is it will never occur to many people that Jesus has significant answers for their struggles unless, unless someone shows them differently. Unless we show them what Jesus is doing in our lives, many non-Christians will totally miss out what Jesus can do for them. Unless they see joy in our work, unless they see peace in our lives as we encounter difficult situations or difficult people or a bad report, they're not likely to 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 get the message that Jesus can make a difference in their lives. Now, we don't know much about Philip's life experiences, We don't know much about his background. All we know is that he was willing to share the good news about Christ. So Philip runs after this guy, jumps on this chariot, probably in that third seat that's facing backwards, right? But then he moves up into the seat where the eunuch is, and he says, dude, I don't know you. Man, I've never met you before, but I was just kind of led by the Spirit of God to approach you and and, and kind of meet up with you today. And the guy was like, I need you. I need you. I'm reading this scripture from Isaiah, and I don't get it. Who was the sheep that was led to the slaughter? Why would he do this without opening his mouth and speaking out? Why would he give his life in such a way? All of these awesome spiritual questions. And here's Philip. This guy was ready for someone to give him the answers to the most important questions of life. And now verse 35 says, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture told him the good news about Jesus. And the guy, he got it. He got it. He's like, man, I want that. That's what I want in my life. Oh, I wonder how many other people are out there that want the same thing. They want this. They want the very same thing that, that, that Philip told the, this, this Ethiopian. And, and God is using us, all of us, as those people who will go. And give them the answers to the most important questions in life. They came to some water. They stopped the chariot. They went into the water. Philip baptized baptized him. The Ethiopian got back on his chariot. And it says he went on his way rejoicing because he was now a life changed by Christ. There's someone out there who needs you. They need you. They need what you have to give. Don't you think for a moment that you don't have what they're looking for. Don't you think for a moment that you don't know enough? Don't you think for a moment that you're too young or that you're too old? Listen, if you know Jesus as your Savior, 
Your life will have been radically changed, and that's all you need to share. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you understand the whole idea of Savior, that you were a sinner, that God loved you, that God sent his son to die for you. That's the story to share. Furthermore, if you've been walking with the Lord and he's been living in your life, he's been working in you, changing things in you, radically blessing you day after day after day. That's what you share, right? You don't know how, you don't have to know theology 204 or whatever, you know, you don't have to know all the stuff. And if, if there's a question that they ask that you can't answer, simply say, can I get your number and get back to you? And then you come and, you know, ask one of the other pastors here, right? For the answer. But, but see, there's ways that we can do this. God has prepared people with questions, with needs, with hearts that are ready to receive Christ, and he prepared you for them. So here's what you do. You pray for the removal of anything in your life that will keep you from hearing the voice of God. Number two, you pray. You pray for the Spirit to reveal that particular person that God has prepared for you. And then number three, prepare, pray and ask God for the opportunity the opportunity, and then run after it. Run after that opportunity. Go find your people. And let me pray for you and me. God, today it is kind of, man, kind of sobering and humbling to think that you, the God of the universe, the God who is beyond it all, over it all, would use us as part of your plan to redeem this world. But we accept that responsibility. We do. We hear loud and clear the words that you gave to your disciples, those who follow you, go. Go and make disciples. And lest we think that was only for those first century disciples, lest we think that's for somebody else, God, we just want to be reminded today that this is for all of us who follow you. It's the operative word for the Christian life. It's to go. And in just a moment, we're about to leave this room, and we're going to go into our homes. We're going to go out into our community. We're going to spend all week out there in this world, and we want to be people sent. We want to be people who are remembering that we're called to go and make a difference. So God, even now, we ask that you would remove everything in our lives that would hinder the Spirit of God from speaking to us. We pray that you would lead us to those people. Bring that one person's name to our mind. Maybe it's already there. Maybe it's been there for a while. And then God, give us the opportunity. Give us the open doors. and Give us the courage to go. Because they're waiting. And you've prepared us. We want to be obedient to that. God, I'm excited about all the stories that will come out of this. I'm excited about the lives that will be changed this week as we go and make a difference. God, we love you. Thank you for counting us worthy to be part of your plan. Amen.